is Conversations in Civics. I'm Dr. Terry Susan Fine. Joining me for this conversation is Nazi Saheb Zamani. Nazi is an IB teacher at Robinson High School in Tampa. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. We're going to talk about domestic and foreign policy, both of which can trigger heated debates. So Nazi, do we have a question? Are we going to start domestically or are we going to start from abroad today? I think we should just start on uh, a general understanding of the difference between domestic policy and foreign policy. That's a great way to start because especially living in a globalized world, it's very easy for the two to gel and to not have very clear boundaries. Domestic policy are those policies dealing with American citizens, dealing with issues on U.S. land and those kinds of policies that are only targeting U.S. citizens and the relationship between the services that government gives to citizens and how citizens respond to those services. When we're talking about foreign policy, we're talking about how the U.S. interacts and interfaces with other countries around the world. Now, some of those relationships are by choice, and some of those relationships are, you know, based on prior agreements, such as with, um, you know, treaties and other kinds of things. Yeah. Well, can you tell me, before we get started talking about specific um, foreign policy issues, can you tell me how we have moved from uh, isolationism to internationalism? You know, those two words, I guess maybe because they start with the letter I or something that people might get them confused. Um, when we talk about this notion of isolationism, isolationism was really the U.S. foreign policy up until World War II. Um, George Washington, in his farewell address in 1796, he wrote, interestingly enough, Nazi, the Washington's farewell address was never delivered as a speech. It was a written document. So he wrote in 1796 in his address that we should just not involve ourselves with the concerns of other nations. That by taking sides, basically, with one country, then another country that's angry at that other country then gets mad at us. And he just basically said, by getting involved in the conflicts of other nations, that it would be bad for America. So we shouldn't do that. That is an isolating tone, because it's saying, I'm going to treat every country the same, and I'm not going to take sides. So that's where isolationism sort of came into the fold. And really, up until, you know, almost the middle of the 20th century, that was the policy. For example, at the end of World War I, uh, President Woodrow Wilson wrote the League of Nations. And he participated in writing up what would become sort of this, you know, worldwide neighborhood watch group, right? That the League of Nations was put in place in order for nations, member nations that were attacked to be protected by other nations. And these nations said, we will come to your aid if you're ever attacked. And yet, even though President Wilson, President of the United States, participated in writing the League of Nations. He brought it back home. And you know that it says in Article 2, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution, that the President negotiates treaties with the advice and consent of the Senate. And so the Senate has to confirm or ratify these, this, these treaties. And the League of Nations was a treaty. And so he just assumed, you know, come home, here's a treaty, sign it. And the Senate refused. And so that was a very isolationist experience because the president was acting out of character of the U.S. isolationist approach. Well, then came World War II. And at the end of World War II, besides the huge loss of life, a big emphasis at the end of World War II was the idea that there were sort of two things that happened during and to end World War II, where the U.S. said, well, we just can't do this anymore. We can't decide that we're isolated by two oceans, right? We can't be isolated by two oceans to the east and the west and two friends to the north and south. We just can't do that anymore. And the two things that happened were, first and foremost, was that um, Harry Truman, in order to end World War II, was he authorized the only time ever in history the use of atomic bombs in warfare. We've used them for testing, but never in warfare. And by bombing Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that 
then communicated the message to the world that atomic uh, energy or nuclear energy or some other thing that could cause the death of millions of people in a matter of seconds, if not minutes, and for those who didn't die, would suffer long-term consequences until the end of their lives, that once you can do that, that we have to sort of think about what it means based on who has that technology. The other thing that happened was the Holocaust. And the Holocaust came as a result of really one person convincing other people um, in the context of really what was a democratic government, right? The Weimar Republic was a democratic government, and Adolf Hitler was elected chancellor. And he, um, with, his, with his followers, and um, uh, was the cause of the, of the death of 13 million people. And of those 13 million people, 6 million were targeted because they were Jewish, and then homosexuals and gypsies and other groups were also targeted. Um, by the Holocaust. So when you look at that, the end of World War II was, okay, what are we going to do? Can we, can we ignore what other countries do to other people? Of course not. So that's when we saw this notion of internationalization, this idea that we now have an internationalist foreign policy, which means that what does go on in the rest of the world does matter to us. And if you were to boil it down to two events, it would be the use of atomic uh, bombs and warfare and the Holocaust. That's great. Can you also, leading more into that, how public opinion shapes foreign policy? Like how do our, um, our leaders use it to shape what we will do overseas? You know, it's interesting that you say that because when we look at public opinion, um, we often look at policymakers sort of responding to public opinion in different ways based on different circumstances. One of the circumstances is, are the constituents concerned with a domestic issue or a foreign policy or international issue? And secondly, how informed is that public? Well, it turns out that, unfortunately, the public is the least informed when it comes to international and global issues. And so what happens is, is that people who are making policy, what they'll often do is, is they will make policy that they believe is in the best interest of their constituents or in the best interest of the nation. And then they'll say, well, I did it for this reason. And they'll then educate the public um, in the way that they believe that the public will understand. Because the public is generally less informed when it comes to international and foreign policy than it is in domestic policy. However, there are certain exceptions to that. What we find is, is that for reasons tied to ethnicity, nation of origin, and religion, that there are certain groups that, because of their own background, have a very strong um, attention when it comes to their country of origin or the country of their focus. So for example, we look at American citizens living in South Florida whose parents, grandparents, great-grandparents uh, came to the United States from Cuba. Mm -hmm. So even though they are you know, born in the United States, American citizens, they call themselves Cuban Americans and they focus a lot of attention on what the president is doing and what other leaders are doing relative to relations with Cuba. Okay, so that would be sort of an ethnic connection there. We look at Israel in the Middle East, right, that even though um, there's a tiny percentage of Jews living in the United States today who were born in Israel or whose parents were born in Israel, there's a religious connection between this particular country and a religious group in the United States. So even though generally speaking, we don't see a lot of impact between public opinion and foreign policy. We do see important pockets, such as among the Cuban population in terms of an ethnic connection and among the Jewish population in terms of a religious connection. Very good, thank you. Um, can you also talk about how the um, president shapes foreign policy towards other, um, other nations and who helps them make those decisions? Well, the president um, shapes foreign policy. The president is often called the world leader. Some scholars have said, well, the president is understood to be the world leader, and therefore he has to interact with the world. And in that vein, though, the president uh, not only has his own ideas about what 
shape foreign policy should take. But the president also has um, help in that regard. So for example, the Secretary of State is the person who represents the United States in foreign policy discussions and foreign policy decision making. And I want to point out to you, Nazi, that the Secretary of State is not a constitutionally uh, derived position. There's no requirement in the Constitution that there should be a Secretary of State. But the Department of State was formed in 1789. And the earliest Secretaries of State were really oriented around sort of the functioning of government, right? So we don't, we don't really think about the Secretary of State as it was originally created to be a foreign policy instrument. Well now, of course, the Secretary of State is only about foreign policy and that person's ideas about how we relate to the world are very important because that person represents the president and represents the nation in terms of who that person interacts with, which countries that person goes to, and you know who, who that person chooses to meet with when they're either here in the United States and which foreign leaders come to the United States, or who that person chooses to interact with over um, um, abroad. So in that vein, though, those issues and those questions become critical because the Secretary of State not only influences the president, but is influenced by the president in terms of representing the president's interests. Yeah. Now, I have to say, though, we have to be very careful in saying that the president and the secretary of state shape foreign policy, because as I said before, the one entity that is in the Constitution that does play a role in foreign policy is the U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Senate, by constitutional requirement, does ratify treaties made by the president. The president negotiates the treaties, but the uh, Senate has to ratify them. So the Senate does play an important role in foreign policy as well. And the Senate is also influenced by public opinion when they form these issues? Well, the Senate is influenced to a point, right? Because the public opinion still has those pockets of lack of information. And at the same time, what some people say is, is that the Founding Fathers were smart to give the Senate a six-year term because that way the Senate could sort of make these difficult decisions and have time to do them and not be so worried about, um, you know, sort of the next election cycle. You know, Nazi, I think we have time just for one more. Do you have one more nugget of information that your students really want to know about? I think they would just like to know more about the Secretary of State and more detail about the, her responsibilities. Well, the Secretary of State's responsibilities uh, are to sort of gather a lot of information, hold meetings, and to, you know, report back to the president. And the Secretary of State is, you know, oftentimes the president's most trusted advisor because after all, in light of the two events that happened after World War II or during World War II that we talked about, right, if that Secretary of State um, represents a point of view uh, regarding trade, regarding the use of nuclear weapons, regarding foreign officials and other kinds of things, then that Secretary of State is going to perhaps uh, put the president and the nation at some kind of risk. I mean, when we learn that some of these rogue states, a rogue state means it's sort of functioning on its own without governance. So when we learn about these rogue states, you know, getting access to plutonium or something that could be used to make a nuclear weapon, um, we have to be very careful about our relationships uh, with those countries and what it means for those rogue states to have access to that technology. Um, you know, way back, you know, really almost 50 years ago, um, uh, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, really, right, to have missiles placed by Russia in Cuba, that was a big uh, concern for the nation in terms of sort of having missiles literally pointed right at the United States. And so it took a lot of negotiating and a lot of work to try to see to it that the president could protect the nation and protect the nation's interest in the process of sort of dealing with those nuclear weapons being placed, you know, 90 miles off of Key West. You know, Nazi, this has been such a pleasant conversation, and I'm afraid to say that our time is done. We've been talking about U.S. foreign policy and some of the concepts related to those policies. That's Conversations in Civics. I'm Dr. Terry Susan Fine.